Welcome to The Last Christian Radio Show with your hosts, Brother J.D. Williams and Brother T.L. Farley. It's now time to grab your Bible as prophecy brings into focus the events playing out on the world stage at incredible speed, right before our very eyes, and exactly as was foretold. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Last Christian Radio Show, and happy Thanksgiving to everyone out there, and especially to Terry from me here in beautiful East Texas, to you and your family in the Dallas and Fort Worth area. Happy Thanksgiving. Well, right back at you and your family. Thank and uh, I, I'm, you're going to have to stay with me on this uh, all the way through because uh, I'm trying to figure out what day it is. But, you know, I'm teasing. <laughs> No, I he's not. Resist. No, he's I not. Uh, uh, I want to remind everybody that um, this is a pre-recorded show. Uh, Terry and I, just like uh, millions across uh, this country, are celebrating uh, Thanksgiving today. And so what we decided to do early this week was to go ahead and record three shows uh, in advance. Um, our Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday show this week are all recorded. All recorded on the same day, by the way. And that's the reason that uh, I'm not going to be playing news because I am not um, able uh, to have any idea of what uh, it might be or might not be in the news today. But I think really that the news of the day on Thursday, November the 24th, is that it's Thanksgiving, that it's time that families come together here and celebrate together. And uh, also, I'm just going to throw this in just for fun, okay? Now, there is a possibility that the rapture had occurred between uh, Tuesday and today, Thursday. Um, and if so, then you're seeing this show simply because it was pre-recorded and pre-loaded and scheduled to play at a certain time. And so if there's been chaos going on for a while now and, you know, people disappeared and planes crashed and mountains fell and all kinds of horrendous things happened and you wonder what it was, well, pay attention today because we're going to tell you what just might have occurred and that, of course, being the rapture of the church. And because, you know, that day comes, Terry, when, uh, when the Lord calls everybody home and, you know, I mean, chances are it hasn't happened. But <laughs> you're absolutely no, you're absolutely right. And let me help people understand uh, how how right you really are. Okay. The expo event is going to be. I always tease people, but it's true. The actual event of the rapture is going to be so fast that if the more you study it, the more you're going to realize. There's no way for you to really grasp, or me, or anybody else, how fast this is going to happen. Right. There, therefore, when he says, you know, there's a good chance it won't happen, it's actually much greater than that. He was being kind and gentle. Uh, the reality is, the odds, if I were in Las Vegas, I would bet against the rapture happening. Okay? <laughs> right, right. Okay? And, and there's going to be billions of moments between now and when Jesus shouts, okay, because it's going to be so fast, those billions of moments could be in this day that we're in. Right. But I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I just did. No, But anyway, the point <laughs> being, is that the odds are, whenever you say it's not going to happen, you're actually in the good camp until the very moment, and I can't go fast enough to to show you what that is but it's going to be so fast when it does happen all bets are off uh, and yeah. i don't know anything about betting now come on you know <laughs> i've got a great story i got to tell you about when i was a kid when i was a kid when i was a young man teaching sunday school in san antonio texas at trinity baptist church on mulberry in case anybody needs to get a map out but anyway, um, we went, we had a little picnic for our little uh, 
first graders and I think it was like from three to five or anyway, but they were all real tiny kids. But anyway, and I had this old pocket watch and we were sitting there on the ground. Uh, they went outside a nice little place and, and we're eating chicken and all that. And uh, all these little kids and all the boys were crowded around me. And one of them saw my the leather on my strap for my old pocket watch. And he, can I see that, Mr. Farley? And I said, sure. And he pulled it out and left it on my belt, but he, it was a big, long leather strap. So he's looking at it, and all the little boys, they crowded around him, ooh, ah, you know, all that. And he turns it over, and on the back is engraved this bus. This was a very old pocket watch that had been worn by a guy, and um, uh, anyway, uh, that he drove a bus. Anyway, so one of the little boys said to me, and the women are coming over because they're like, what are all these kids doing over here talking to, to Farley? And so they come over, and they're kind of listening into the conversation. And um, one of them said to me, well, gee, Mr. Farley, where did you get this watch? Now, remember, we're all relaxed. We're, we're not thinking about anything. And so I'm just being truthful. Okay. Right. So he says, gee, Mr. Farley, where did you get this watch? I says, well, I wanted shooting craps. And they said, all right, boys, come on. We're all, we're all going over. Anyway, I, I just had to throw that in. Anyway, well, talking about time. Yeah. Anyway. Well, yeah, and you're, you're talking about some B.C. days there, the before Christ days as well. Um, no. Yeah. Well, actually, it was. I got it before that. That's right. Because right. some, sometimes when I tell these stories, yeah. you'll say B.C., and I'll say no, uh, A.C., but anyway. And, and that's yeah. not a song, by the way, folks. Don't yeah. look it up for a record. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, no, you're fine. Uh, no, um, when it comes to gambling, I've done my share. You know, I mean, used to, uh, uh, again, having worked for American Airlines for many years, uh, the one thing that I really enjoyed about the fact that I worked for an airline was how, mm -hmm. how cheap it was to travel. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I went to Vegas a lot. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I traveled the world. Uh, I used to, um, mm -hmm. one thing... Um, this is something that few people have an opportunity to do unless you're in the elite class, you know, the the, yeah. the rich the rich class. Well, th this yeah. applies to airline people, too, that get to travel for next to nothing. Uh, I, I actually used to take a, pl a, a flight. I'd do it maybe, maybe a couple, three times a year, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where I would invite somebody. Uh, hey, you, you want to go to dinner tonight in London? Okay, and that's exactly what we'd do. We would take a flight, we'd fly to London, we'd have dinner or breakfast, whatever the case may be as to what time we got there, turn around and come right back. That's how easy it was uh, in the airlines, you know, and how cheap it was in the airlines. So uh, anyway, uh, we would also go to Vegas quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Spent a lot of time mm -hmm. uh, going to Vegas, you know, and, and uh, now... I don't encourage people to gamble, but if you do, uh, one thing that I did, uh, which was actually pretty successful, was to treat gambling like you would going to a football game or a concert or, you know, some type of entertainment event. In other words, when I went to Vegas, I had a certain amount of money that I would spend for gambling slash entertainment. That's what my gambling was. My gambling was entertainment. My gambling was, I know I'm probably going to lose every bit of this. So, mm -hmm. it's, so it's just like I bought a ticket to go to a concert or go to a football game that costs this much money. I know I've spent mm -hmm. that money, mm -hmm. and once that mm -hmm. money has been spent, I can't get it back, okay? Mm -hmm. I bought my ticket, okay? Well, mm -hmm. I bought my ticket to go to Vegas and spend X number of dollars on entertainment, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if I won, which sometimes I did, great. Mm -hmm. If I lost, mm -hmm. well, okay, I expected that. It was entertainment, mm -hmm. but I didn't mm -hmm. go 
to the point of spending and spending and spending. Again, I am not encouraging anybody to go out and gamble, but if you do, treat it like entertainment. Set your limit. Just set your limit and play it. And once you've lost it, don't say, oh, well, you know, if I just play just a little bit longer, I can get it back. No, don't do that. Once you've spent your entertainment money, your entertainment is done. It is time to go home now. And if you'll do it like that, You know, I I think you're in much better shape. Again, not encouraging gambling, but if you do, do it uh, responsibly, I guess would be the way. And I I know that... You're in deep water now. I have to throw throw this one in. Um, I did say that that, that getting that watch was after I became a Christian. And so I think I probably need to explain it. What happened was I was working in a restaurant, washing dishes, and there was another guy there that was washing dishes, and I was a Christian now. And uh, he was known for being a heavy-duty gambler. He was known for it. Everybody knew it. And he was very good at it, very successful. But he couldn't get me to gamble. And I told him, I said, you don't understand. I'm a Christian. I don't gamble anymore. Right. And, and he just kept, you know, kept on, kept on. So finally, he said, well, why won't you gamble with me and i said mo his name was mo i said mo the truth is i never lose and i said before i became a christian i i did all kinds of things you know you can gamble with money but you can gamble with your life right and and so i but once i became a christian all of that went away i I didn't do any of it Mm -hmm. any anything and I told him, well, we were there working together, washing dishes all the time, and he was always after me. And uh, finally, I told him, I said, Mo, I, I will go ahead because you're being so persistent. I said, but you're going to lose everything. And he said, oh, no, no. And I said, okay. So we started, and it was little. It wasn't, it was a quarter, 50 cents. It wasn't, you know. Right. And so we went ahead, and I cleaned him out, whatever he had on in cash, <laughs> cleaned him out. And he was so mad that mm-hmm. he pulled out that pocket watch, which was uh-huh. beautiful. I still have it today. Anyway, he pulled it out and he said, I'm gonna, I want it. I said, no, Mo, I don't want your watch. I don't, you know. And he just kept after me. And I said, okay, but this is it. I said, because you don't have anything else. You can't <laughs> go anywhere and get, nobody's going to loan you any money. Mm-hmm. This is it. This is, you know. And he said, okay. So we went ahead and I want his watch. And that's where that <laughs> came from. And then, and like I said, I never, you know, I never went near it again. And, and I don't. And I, But I have to be honest. I'm not attracted to it. Um, I see these uh, ads on the football games all the time where they've got these new gambling things going. Yeah, right. And I, my, heart, my heart goes out. And you're going to love this. You're going to love my segue here. I love, uh, I, I see the ads on the, on the gambling. And I love the picture that I can see when I'm seeing them do this. First of all, I'm saying to people, because they're telling them to set limits. Like they say, be responsible. Well, there are people, just like drinking, be responsible. There are people that can't be. Right. And right. And, and, and so I don't even want to tempt anybody. But what I got thinking about it was, okay, you're gambling with this. Let me ask you something. Are you gambling with your life? Do you know for certain you're going to heaven? Right. Or are you gambling on it? Are you saying, well, I hope I make it. The Bible says you can know it. First John 5.13, these things, yeah. speaking of the scriptures, right. these things are written that you may know, present tense, that you have eternal life. <clears throat> Someone told me that they had been taught uh, in Roman Catholicism, actually, is where I, I need to be f- a full full exposure on this. Uh, They were Roman Catholic. They were going to a school and they were teaching them and they got to that verse and they said, well, yeah, look at what the verse says. It says you may know. In other words, you may know, you may not know. Without going into the Greek, I took them right down the line on the verse and I said, look what it says. It says that you may know that you have. Present tense. Mm -hmm. I said, if it was a question They wouldn't be using have. You have eternal life, even you who believe on his name, and that you will believe on his name. In other words, once you become a Christian and you know it, like Joel, like me, like all the people that you don't like that are Christians that keep telling you about Jesus, it's because we know it, and we know no matter what happens, we're going to heaven. 
okay? Mm -hmm. And the battle now is to do the best we can for Jesus when we do it. But let me say this one last time, don't gamble with your eternal life. Jesus paid for it, receive it. Amen. And that is a perfect segue because what, um, I, as I explained on the uh, Tuesday edition of the show, today we're going to talk about our personal testimony. And uh, I think Terry can go a lot more in depth. He's older than me, so he's got more life. No, I've been to anyway. <laughs> oh. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm going to give him uh, the second half of the show to uh, to go in because uh, he's got an extremely interesting life that I know that you guys are going to really enjoy for those of you that get the second half of the show. If you don't, go to www.lastchristian.net. Uh, and you'll you'll get that second half of the show or on of course on our YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed yet to YouTube, please do so. Uh, we would appreciate it. Um, and of course, the station, the uh, the channel's growing, and it, it's all about getting the word of Jesus Christ out. So I don't have as much time as I'd like to do mine. I I'll really, give you some of mine. You can take some of uh, mine. Uh, but, don't worry about that. Uh, but don't it, never worry about time with Jesus. You go <laughs> ahead and you get what you need. And if you need to come in on mine, I can cut mine short. I can uh, actually edit. We no, you're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. <laughs> I, I thought uh, you were going to say, no, you can't cut back. But anyway. <laughs> uh, no, no, you're, you're fine, Terry. Um, anyway, um, I, I am going to try to give you all an idea. Um, I um, I grew up in a very Christian home. I was adopted when I was two days old. Uh, since fast forward decades, I reunited with my birth mother, my birth family. When you go from being an only child to one of seven, it's kind of a shock, you know. But anyway, that's that that's for another show at another time. I was adopted. I grew up. Excuse me. I grew up in a very Christian family. My dad was a deacon. My mother played piano at the church. My first memories of church are of me spent on the front row of Fairview Baptist Church in Grand Prairie, Texas, from about the age of five. Um, they put me on the front row for one reason. My mom was a pianist. My dad was a deacon. And they wanted to make sure I didn't do anything stupid, so they put me on the front row where my mom had a uh, direct view of me. But I grew up believing in God. Never questioned that. Not a day of my life did I ever question that, that, there, was, that there was a God. I got really inv involved in the church was a part of what they called the RAs, Royal Ambassadors. Um, I had a bunch of friends at church and enjoyed going to church. But about, uh, oh, probably fifth grade, they discovered that I was a really good basketball player because my dad was a basketball coach in addition to being a teacher. And after school and after practice, the members of his team, fifth and sixth graders, would look down to this little second and third grade kid, the coach's son, and work with him every day. So by the time I started playing competitively in the fifth grade, I was really good. I was ahead of the curve. Number one scorer, new basketball, loved it. It became my life. So by the time I got into junior high, basketball was my life. I didn't care about anything else. There was a basketball in my hand all the time, even in bed, even at the dinner table. That basketball was there. So I started hanging out with a lot of the wrong people. And one day, my parents got a call. I have no idea from who. Warning them that their son was hanging out with the wrong folks at school. My dad came to me in a very loving manner and gave me this report. And his purpose, of course, was to try and guide me away from what was going on. But I'm a teenager at this point, or at least close to it. Yeah, I was a teenager. I was, uh, by the time this occurred, I was 16 years old. 
and actually going into high school. And I took offense to this report. And I got into my little 1972 Ford Pinto with a little four-speed non-air-conditioned car and drove to the church that I had attended since I was five years old and bolted into the pastor's office, a pastor that I had known since I was five years old and loved with all my heart. And I walked up to that preacher and I said, you have interfered with my life. I don't like it. You take me off the rolls. You never mail me again. Don't call me. You forget that I was ever a member of this church. I don't ever want to hear from any of you ever again. You're interfering in my life. And I walked out of his office without hearing a response. I got back in my car. I went home and I walked away from the church for decades. Decades. Now, I called myself a Christian, but I acted Nothing like a Christian should act. I've told you guys about my experiences as someone that was involved with the airline industry, and I was cold, cold, cold. I did not care who I stepped on. I didn't care what I had to do. My only joy in life was the airlines. I could spend 18 hours a day working and I would be just as happy as a lark because my basketball days were over. I'd, I had suffered a bad injury after being recruited all across the country to play for different schools. I'd gone, I'd been injured, and back then they didn't have the surgeries that they do today. My career was over. My dreams of playing in the NBA, which was basically assured, were over. And I had gotten into the airline, and, and I had substituted basketball for work. I had a family, but I didn't pay much attention to them because work was more important. I spent more time on the road than I did at home. I spent more time at the office than I did at home. I was far from a Christian. And when I finally began to realize that... It was all over with the airlines, and I walked away from them and went basically into retirement, even though I had a few other odd jobs. I knew there was something missing in my life, but I didn't know what it was. I used to listen to people who were Christians say, hey, can't you remember this time in your life when God did this and God did that? And everybody's nodding their head, yeah, yes, yes. And I was nodding my head too the whole time. Yeah, yeah. And the whole time I'm thinking, nope, not a single time. I can't remember where God ever did anything for me. Nothing. So I took a family vacation. We went to Galveston, Texas. My wife needed to recharge. Spent three days. I can't swim a lick. Not any. I mean, you give me enough time, I can float. That's it. I can float, but I can't swim at all. So over the next few days out there in Galveston Bay, that nice warm water, I floated around. And I looked around, and I was like, why can't people believe in God? Isn't that incredible that I actually said that? But I did. I can remember it. Isn't it incredible people can't believe in God with all this beauty? And I'd reach down with my foot, touch the bottom, Everything was beautiful until that last day in Galveston when I reached down and I couldn't touch the bottom and I realized I was too far from shore and I was about to go into my freak out mode that I did every time I was faced with a situation like that. I was just about to freak out and had I done that, I would have sunk to the bottom and no one would have ever seen me again because I was so far out that there was no way anybody was going to get to me. I was dead. Except there was this little voice that came in there. Not audible. I always make it clear. Not audible. But it was a voice nonetheless. And it said, hey, stop. You got out there. Go back the same way. And I did that. And then I spent the next few weeks wondering exactly why I didn't react the same way I had every other time. Why I didn't sink this time like I did every other time. Why I didn't die when I was in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Atlantic Ocean, 200 yards from shore with absolutely no hope. What was the difference? What was the difference this time? Well, I told you I needed more time, Terry. 
because I can't finish the story. That's fine. We, I can't listen, finish the story. We've so got all the time. We've I, got all the time in this world and in the next. So I you am, take all the time I, you need. I am going to finish it off in the second half because I want to invite those of you who have called yourself Christian to please understand that if you don't know you're saved, then you need to listen to the second half. You need to listen to Terry's story as well in the second half. But you need to make certain that you are saved. Now, we're going to lose a bunch of you, so I encourage you to go to www.lastchristian.net. That's www.lastchristian.net for the second half of the show. Or watch us on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel while you're there. And I'm going to finish off this story in the second half of the show for you guys. Uh, it's always difficult for me to go uh, and, and talk about it. Here we go. See you guys in just about a minute and a half. Well, that music means that for some of you, we have reached the end of this edition of The Last Christian Radio Show. Remember, if you'd like to catch the second half of the show or hear any of our past episodes, all you need to do is go to www.lastchristian.net. That's www.lastchristian.net for all episodes of The Last Christian Radio Show with J.D. Williams and T.L. Farley. For everyone else, we'll be back in about 30 seconds for the second half of the internationally syndicated Last Christian Radio Show. We certainly appreciate you joining us this evening and hope that you'll join us every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday evening at 7.30 p.m. Central Time for a brand new edition of the Last Christian Radio Show. Welcome back to the second half of the syndicated Last Christian Radio Show with J.D. Williams and T.L. Farley. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the second half of the Last Christian Radio Show. And Terry, I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm a little disappointed I wasn't able to get all that in for the, uh, for the audience that's not here, but I do think it's important to finish it. Uh, oh, because, I do too. Uh, I'm, I'm, you've got me on the edge of my seat, literally. <laughs> I'm, lo I'm loving every second of it. And, and, and by the way, uh, that is only a showing of God working in your life, Joel, right. because you, the more you get into giving people your testimony about how you came to be a Christian, uh, the deeper it gets. So rock and roll. I'm loving every minute of it. Well, you take all the time. <clears throat> Listen, we've got more shows coming up. I can give mine some other time. Don't worry <laughs> about it. You go till you go till you're finished. Well, okay? uh, thank you, Terry. I appreciate that. Um, I like I said, I always. I always considered myself to be a Christian. You know, if people even ask me over the years, you know, are you a Christian? And I say, oh, yeah, I, I believe in God. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I really did. I mean, you know, I, I really felt as though I was a Christian, but my actions and the way that I handled life and the language that I used and everything else was far from being a Christian in any way, shape, or form. Um, and at the same time, there was always an urging. There was always, uh, I always knew there was something, something missing. Because I, I can't remember the verse uh, in the Bible, but uh, they even had it up at our old church there at, uh, back in Mesquite in the children's department. Uh, I'll try to get it as close as I can, and maybe you'll know the exactly. Um, raise up a child in the ways of God, and you know, you know never raise ne up a child in the way in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Amen. That's it. That is it. Okay. Uh, and, you know, I, I feel like that that's what was instilled in me 
by my adopted mother and dad, who I still consider to be my mom and dad, uh, even, even though I have been reunited with my birth mother. Okay, we have to take a quick break. Yeah. KRRBDB, Grand Saline, Canton, Mineola, Texas. Okay, that's out of the way. So, um, anyway, I, I felt like I was, I, I feel like that that verse goes directly to me because that's exactly what happened because I was raised up. You know, um, I, I can tell you, I never, I heard my mother say one curse word in her whole life. You know, in as far you know, in, in my life, my my memory, she said one curse word in her in the whole time that I can remember, and I can even say it on the air because it's not that bad, okay? Mm-hmm. And that is, she was cooking one day, and there was a lot of frustration going on. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I mean, you know, it's just like everything had come down all at one time. It was all you know, bad day, bad day, bad day, bad week you know, bad whatever, and something else happened, and it was like the last straw, Mm -hmm. and I heard her say, damn it, Mm -hmm. okay, and that was it, and I can remember the shock, I was like, mom said a cuss word, I couldn't believe it, I mean, it was like the world came to an end, that's the kind of family that I was raised in, You, you didn't hear it, you didn't hear profanity, Okay, you didn't hear it at all. I knew a lot of cuss words. I used them all the time. Okay, but not in that house. But anyway, to get back to the story, again, I I feel like that they had grounded me. So it never, you know, God was never out of my life, but I had forgotten about him and I'd put him in second place. I had been Mm -hmm. baptized. And another part of the story here is I was about 12 years old. There was three of us in the church I attended, Fairview Baptist Church in Grand Prairie, Texas. There was three of us that were really close, and everybody in the church called us the Three Musketeers because if you saw one of us, you saw us all. And then there was another one. There was another kid that hung out with us sometimes, but he wasn't in, he wasn't in the clique. You know, he wasn't he wasn't a part of us. He was, you know, I, I don't think they came to church as much. They didn't show, you know, it didn't show up as much as, as as Tom and Keith did. And so anyway, um, I kept seeing people being saved, going down, you know, uh, accept Christ, be baptized, you know, and all that stuff. And and um, I decided that I was going to accept Jesus Christ that coming up Sunday. I was going to do that. Okay, I was going to go down, I was going to be saved, I was going to be baptized, and everybody was going to be happy with me. It was all pre-planned. It was 100% pre-planned, if you, if you can believe that. Okay, So it was, um, I don't even remember, but it was a time, time of year we had two services for some reason. And so the first service, I was still in Sunday school class. Mm-hmm. And with Tom and Keith, my normal buddies, and... After that Sunday school class, I'm going to go to that second service, and I'm going to accept Christ in that second service. And as I got there and I walked in the sanctuary, somebody came up to me. I think it was my mom came up to me, and she said, Oh, it's been such a wonderful day. Brent was saved this morning. And I went, No. I mean, you know, in my mind, I mean, you know, as far as, as, far as um, my outward I'm sure my jaw dropped, you know, and but inside I'm going, he just stole my day. This jerk that doesn't even hang out with us, he just stole my glory because he accepted Christ before me. You know, I mean, now I really, you know, I can remember that, you know, vividly. Sure. And I sure. went through it. I went through it. I went ahead and did what I was supposed to do. I got saved, supposedly, and I was mm-hmm. baptized a week or so later, and, you know, I'm a Christian now. No. Mm-hmm. No, it was all show. It was 100% show. Okay, I was not saved. I can look back on that now and say I was not saved. But I thought I was. So I went through all my life like that. Okay, so getting back to Galveston now, I have survived this. Okay, and I'm back now on the shore, and I'm wondering why I didn't do what I always did, like if I was in a swimming pool or something, flail away till I sunk. 
you know, hit the bottom, struggle my way over, pull my way up, and get out. Well, there wasn't any swimming pool. There wasn't any way to get out. So if I'd have done what I always did, I was dead, okay? <laughs> but some way or another, I wasn't dead, and I had made it, and I couldn't figure out what was different. And I struggled with that for weeks, if not months. And one day, Anita came to me and said, you know what, I'd, I'd like to go to church. I'm in. Maybe this will answer my question. Okay, maybe this will answer my question for me. So I went to church. I went to Oaks Drive Baptist Church in Mesquite, Texas with Reverend Jim Burke. That's the second time I've given him a plug, by the way. Okay. He's... He's going to so, be calling for that check. <laughs> so I, I went and, you know, for the next several weeks, and I can't put a time frame on it, but anyway, for the next several weeks, every Sunday when I went to church, again, professing myself to be a Christian, everybody in church thought I was a Christian. Okay? I mean, I, was, I even became a member of the uh, Building and Grounds Committee for the church. Okay? I was active. Yeah, there, we were there every, every, every time a church opened, we were there. And so, anyway, on Sunday mornings for the next several weeks, Jim preached all his sermons right at me. Right at me. He wasn't talking to anybody else in the church. He was talking to me. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's how I interpreted it. So, mm -hmm. and Anita was sick one Wednesday night, and I went. You know where I lived, Terry. I was real close to the church. There well, was any reason sure. for us to miss. Just like you, you can walk to church. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, Anita was sick. I went on that Wednesday night, and after the service was over, I worked up my courage, and I went up to Jim, who I had become friends with, and I said, Jim, I've got some concerns. Can I talk to you in your office for a minute? And he said, sure. And we went back there, and... I said, okay, here's the deal, Jim. This, you know, and and I, I laid it out to him. I laid out my feelings about, you know, being unsure about things. And but you know, I was saved when I was 12 years old. I was baptized when I was 12 years old. And but I've still got, you know, I've still got these, you know, this this happened to me in Galveston. I couldn't figure this out. I explained the whole thing to him, exactly the way it went down. I mean, you know, this went on for quite a period of time. And, and Jim was was uh, just sitting there very, very patiently listening to me go on and on and on. And so I finally got done with all this stuff. And my, my question was, okay, now... Knowing all that, and knowing that I was saved when I was 12 years old and everything, I'm good, right? Mm -hmm. And so Jim looked at me very matter-of-factly, not criticizing, not, uh, you know, he wasn't judgmental in any way, shape, or form, uh, very lovingly, but directly. And he just said to me, I just got one question. If you died tonight, would you go to heaven? That's it. That's all he said. And my immediate reaction to that was, that's what I'm asking you. Okay, that's what I'm asking you. That's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. And I realized at that very moment that by him asking that question, he provided to me my answer. And that was, no, I wouldn't. And I accepted Jesus Christ in his office that night, mm -hmm. right then. And my life changed at that moment, right then, in that moment. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. last thing I want to say about this, because, I, again, I had professed myself to be a Christian in this church. This church wasn't a mega church. This wasn't some huge thousands and thousands and thousands of people church. It had it didn't yet even have a live stream broadcast. Okay, mm -hmm. that that came later on. Mm -hmm. Um but everybody in that church, my Sunday school class members and just general members of the church, 
all looked at me as a Christian. I was already a Christian. And so every time the invitation was played at the end of a church service, nobody was looking at me to walk down there because I was already a Christian. But when I accepted Jesus in, in Jim's office that night, he looked at me and he said, okay, now you know what you got to do, right? I said, what's that? You got to go down there Sunday morning and, you know, you have to let the church know that you just accepted Christ. I can't do that, Jim. I can't do that. <laughs> these, 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 these people already think I'm a Christian. Well, you know, well, let's just move on. You know, let's forget about that part of it. You know, I, I don't need to do all that again. Uh, we're, we're, we're good. We're good. And it's like, no, you, you really need to do that. And I was like, I don't know if I can do that because what are these people going to think of me after I have professed myself to be a Christian all this time and now mm -hmm. I go down and accept Christ? Well, I'm probably going to lose every friend in this church. Everybody's going to look at me differently. They're never going to have want to have anything to do with me again because I lied to them. Mm -hmm. And he said, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. And I, went, I don't know about all that, but okay. I went home. I went home that Wednesday night, and I didn't even tell Anita what happened. Didn't even tell her because I wasn't sure if I could do that. I wasn't sure if I could walk down that aisle that next Sunday morning. I really mm -hmm. wasn't. Uh, and, of course, I, looking back, I know exactly what that was. That, that was Satan. That was 100% Satan telling me, don't do mm -hmm. that, don't do that. Mm -hmm. yes. And so, anyway, Sunday comes. And, number one, I tried to figure out if I was going to go to church. And that was, <laughs> that was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that Beautiful. was uh, that that was different because you know we were faithful we were going every week uh, but you know maybe I can be sick this Sunday and nobody will pay attention to it and I'll, we'll get we'll get by this okay so I figured well you know that's not going to work so I, I get ready we go to church and I walk in the door of the church and uh, I'm walking down to my Sunday school class still trying to figure out what I'm going to do. I mean, this was just driving me nuts, right? And uh, I saw Jim, and um, he walked up to me, looked at me, and he said, You ready? And I said, Nope. <laughs> no, I am not. You know, what's wrong? Well, you know what's wrong. I told you about it already. You know, he said, You'll be fine. You'll be fine. That's all he would ever tell me. You'll be fine. So I went to Sunday school and um, got through that. Uh, didn't tell anybody what was coming because I still wasn't sure if I could do it or not. Okay, so then we get down to it. We get down to the uh, end of the service and that invitation is played. And I mean, I've been thinking about this through the entire Sunday service. I don't even remember anything you said that week. I mean, you remember I told you that, you know, I, every sermon was directed at me. Well, that particular sermon, I don't even think I heard it. Because, you know, I, because this inner battle was going on throughout the entire, entire service. And so, anyway, the invitation starts to play. And all of a sudden, I got this influx of... Uh, I don't know. I even know how to describe it. You know, uh, power from above, or whatever you want to call it, that said "go." And I looked at Anita, and because I didn't want her to freak out, you know. So as I looked over at her, and I said, "I got something to do. Be back, and I'll be back." Hold on. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, it's, it's playing, and. Um, I walked down that aisle, and I tried to I tried to be like one of those horses, you know, that's got the blinders on, where you don't look on either side. <laughs> I was like, looking straight ahead, and um, I walked down to to Jim, and I don't remember the words that were spoken in any way, shape, or form. Um. But I do remember saying, 
Jim, I have to be certain I'm saved. And that was from my heart because I knew I knew I had been saved that Wednesday night. I mean, I felt the change instantly. I knew I was different. Uh, I, kn- I knew I was already working on it, but I also know that Jesus said that you know that you need to profess your faith and you know you need to you need to be baptized if you can. You know, I mean, I realize that certain people there's just for certain reasons they can't be baptized and bapti- baptism believe it or not now I know I get a lot of flack for this but baptism is not a requirement to salvation okay that's right amen so amen amen <laughs> so uh, I knew I didn't I do I knew that wasn't required of me but now I had just stepped up there and you know people go up in the front of the church all the time for an invitation you know they may need to you know just talk to the pastor for a minute or whatever you know so at this point nobody's going to think anything you know okay you just went up there to say something to jim or whatever until the second that he pointed to the pew and made me sit down there okay Mm -hmm. now it's different now it's a little bit different okay and so okay, well, what is that all about? I'm sure is what it had to had to have gone through a few people's minds, and so once that was done, once the invitation was over, and he invited me up with him, now for the first time, I've got to face this church that I had told that I was a Christian, and for the first time, tell them no, I was not a Christian. But I am now. But I am now. And I didn't know what to expect. I knew what I feared, that I would lose a lot of friends, that I would lose a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. But at the moment that he said that I had accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior in his office, Mm -hmm. the applause the cheering, the applause Amen. that Amen. came that came from that church. Amen. Amen. Bless him. Bless him. Uh, yeah. Bless him. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Jesus. Amen. Amen. People don't understand. God bless you. Amen. People don't understand what you're talking about right now. Some people, some people like me are rejoicing with you because we know we know what you're going through even now even now even now and you didn't know you were going to do this did you <laughs> you, see? you see you didn't know it you didn't know it. you if you if i had suggested to you that that was going to happen you you just said you're crazy farley and i'd say now don't change the subject this is what you this is what you're gonna do because i never deny being crazy but, but but anyway no amen god bless you this is gonna do more for the kingdom of god uh, than anything uh, that we can say or do um because what you're what you're revealing is the power of god to work in a man's heart to work in his mind you know i I'm, i've been saved 50 years and almost 50 years and i'm still every morning is new every morning is different every i was talking about jesus at a messianic congregation yesterday uh no saturday but i was talking about it and i got to a point where i was talking about something that was very sensitive and i started to cry and there was a guy next to me he was just got out of prison and he's a new christian and when i got done he raised his hand he said i can cry <laughs> well uh i um uh, uh, you're you're right i had no idea that was going to happen and i apologize yeah, amen. i knew it sure i uh, didn't expect it um but listen i've been talking uh, to this guy for months and months and months and i never saw that in him and <laughs> I see a whole uh, new, a whole uh, new side of JD Williams. <laughs> uh, but um, I can't tell you the difference that 
was made in my life and the reason that the reason that that I, I always emphasize that part of it the the going down and making yes. the, the profession is because I know I'm not the only one mm -hmm. that is older that is you know in in the I, I was in my 50s 50s 60s 70s mm -hmm. I don't I don't know I'm not the only one that has told you know thinks that they're a Christian has always said they were a Christian or whatever and may be embarrassed um, mm -hmm. to to make that commitment to go down and make that profession of faith you know mm -hmm. for fear of losing a friend or for fear of losing respect yeah. Yeah. and I want you to know it's okay I, I did it I did it Amen. okay Amen. And, uh, Amen. and it's you you cannot replace the joy you just can't mm -hmm. play, can't you know I mean yes mm -hmm. I get emotional about it as obviously mm -hmm. uh, Amen. to Amen. this to this day sure. but that's what Christ means to a Christian yes amen yeah. and uh, you know I I'm always happy to talk to people and encourage them to become a Christian but that story that testimony I always fear giving it because of that reaction that seems to yeah. always happen you know I can't I mean I always think I always think well okay I've got that out of my system you know that won't happen yeah. again and then, uh -uh. No. and then here we go you, don't, you know you don't, it's unavoidable you amen amen so, I, I, uh, when I was a young Christian when I was a young Christian um, I I would do that almost every service uh, just you know I would break down and just you know and uh, my first pastor he used to tell people because people would be looking at me like what is that guy doing and he'd say well he'd say God gave Terry a double bucket full of tears <laughs> that's yeah. what he would say yeah. but but it, it it became it became so to me so oppressive that I actually went to the Lord. There came a point where I went to the Lord and I began to pray, Lord, I'm going to go to church tonight. Please don't let me cry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. No, no, wait a minute. Oh, I can believe that. And yeah. I, yeah. And, I, and I said, Lord, don't let me cry. And one night I went in and I prayed that as I was going in. And my heart turned to stone. And I turned so cold, I can't even explain it to you. And it went on for several weeks, just stone cold. Nothing touched me. Nothing bothered me. I was I was like that guy you were describing that you were back when you were working for the airlines. Right. I was like that guy. Only yeah. I had never only I had never been like that. I didn't know what it was. And so one night I was in the service. And I realized what was happening, and I just called out to the Lord, and I said, "Lord, I ask your forgiveness." I said, "You can let me cry anytime you want, <laughs> night or day. So I don't care. Just yeah. I said, let me. I said, just take away this coldness, this yeah. stone. Take right. it away." Right. And He did. And then from then on, He began to kind of regulate me. So <laughs> if I hit something, if I hit a soft spot, yeah. boy, I do. I, I bust out in tears. Yeah. Uh, you know, in fact, like I said, I did it the other day at this at this breakfast, uh, Jewish Messianic, and we were talking about the Lord. And, and I just got so close in terms of his presence and reality. I just busted out crying, you know, and, and, and it didn't bother me at all. Right. And, you know, and, and, and that blesses a lot of people. But the point is, I just thank God. This was like a, a breakthrough. And let me tell you why. Because like you said, you've done this before. But let me tell you something else. You've never done this on camera. 
True. Now, now you're getting to understand. Joel, uh, Joel and I talk all the time. I, I, I had a very strange walk in life in, in show business. I'm, I'll talk about that some other time. But anyway, the point being is I'm always teasing him. Something will happen. And I'll say, well, man, you're getting into Hollywood now. <laughs> because of that happened. Well, he just he just stepped into Hollywood again. He just went to the front of the seat, or the front of the row. I mean, you know, he went to the front of the theater. There it is, you know. And uh, but but you know, yes. And and uh, praise God. This is a see what I mean. This is a special day. Every yes. day is a Amen. special day. Amen. And it was your idea to, for us to give our testimonies. Yeah. And neither one of us. Neither one of us called, saw this coming. No. And I'm going to shut up. For, I'm going to uh, shut up for a minute. Uh, and let you uh, let you go on and whatever. Well, yeah. You know, the only thing that I want to say there again is that uh, I hope that this this today and what I was able to to say will touch someone out there that is older that is afraid or ashamed, feeling ashamed to to make the commitment and give you give them the courage to go ahead and do it because you're going to feel so much better after you do you really are Amen. and and more than that more than that you'll be saved you'll be a Christ, you you you'll be assured of your salvation and you will know that you are indeed saved and yeah, it, the the difference between the before and the after is something that you can't even begin to explain. I mean, it is just an incredible difference, and mm-hmm. I am I'm glad I went through it. I didn't particularly mm-hmm. um, I didn't look forward to that Sunday morning, Terry. I didn't look forward no, to it at all. I could tell, but I could tell. Um, but um, once it was over, I fully appreciated it. And yes, you know, Amen. and to have the church embrace me the way that they did, mm-hmm. uh, Jim was right. You'll be okay. I was okay, yeah. and everything yeah. was fine. And yeah. uh, instead of instead of feeling as though I was being ostracized from the church, mm-hmm. instead of feeling like I that people were standoffish or whatever, I had more people come to me. I had mm-hmm. there there was a greater relationship. There was that mm-hmm. Christian relationship between myself mm-hmm. and other Christians. And mm-hmm. um, so anyway, if you have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I I truly hope you will. I apologize to Terry Farley for not giving him the time today to give his testimony because <laughs> I took the whole show. I got, I, got, I got news for you, JD. I'm just I'm just warming up. <laughs> you know, but people people, people want to hit me with a bat sometimes because I won't stop. Don't you worry about that. You haven't taken any of my time. All of my time is God's. All of it. Amen. And I can well, sit here and not say anything, or I can speak whatever you want. And don't even worry. About it. Well, uh, I'm just going to tell you that you're still up because um, we we got <laughs> we, we got one we got one more show to tape this week. Um, the uh, the Saturday edition, and um, it's a wrap. And so anyway, uh, that is going to be uh, Terry Farley's all the way. So. Uh, anyway, I, I hope that maybe this message may have touched someone out there. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please do so. Now, um, we are coming down here to the end. I hope that everybody has had a wonderful Thanksgiving day. Uh, and I hope that if the Lord doesn't call the church before time, that uh, you'll join us this Saturday evening at 7.30 p.m. Central Time for another edition of of the last christian radio show uh we're looking for that last individual to accept christ before the rapture and we don't want you to be the one that misses the bus okay so anyway if we're here saturday be sure and tune in 7 30 p.m central time for another edition of the last christian radio show until then good night and may god bless you amen 
Thanks again for joining us today for The Last Christian Radio Show. And be sure to tune in every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday right here on Revelation Radio. And don't forget to join us every Wednesday evening at 7.30 p.m. Central for The Last Christian Podcast, now available on all major podcast platforms and at www.lastchristian.net. Until the trumpet sounds...